Hi everyone, Brian here and back again for another deck review as part of my My Kind of Magic series. And uh, for today's walkthrough I wanted to share with you a deck which is a bit different to the other decks I've shown so far in this series because so far we've covered a couple of Chaos Magic decks, the Forty Servants and uh, Peter J. Carroll's Epoch, Esotericon and the Portals of Chaos which was my last uh, walkthrough and we've also looked at um, the uh, the Magician's deck, Quaria, the Magician's deck, and although they're all fantastic decks and certainly very interesting decks to study if you're interested in magic, um, there is something about them that makes them a little bit difficult to um, uh, to engage with if you are quite new to magic and are a bit nervous about what magic is about and how you might use it and how you might use decks as uh, tools. Um, so a few people have said to me that they um, aren't quite ready to jump in with that, that level of deck, although others of course can just go straight into to that kind of thing. So um, there's no, not really any such thing as a beginner's deck or a more advanced deck when it comes to uh, tarot or magic. It's all to do with what you uh, resonate with and what works for you at the time. But a number of people have said to me that the, the decks you've shown so far in this series are great, um, but they're a little bit too heavy for us. So have you got anything to suggest that would be a bit easier to engage with if you're very new to magic and or tarot? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice a little bit. <clears throat> well, um, first of all, the thing, first thing to say is that any tarot deck, of course, can be employed uh, for magical practice. So find a tarot deck you like, um, one that you can engage with, one that you uh, find yourself drawn to, and there you have it, you have your, your deck. Uh, and there are books on the market um, which describe how you can use tarot in magical con context. So if you, uh, you know, go and search for them on Amazon or Goodreads, then I'm sure you'll find something. But today I did want to share with you a deck that I think fits the bill if you are relatively new to either tarot or magic or indeed both. Uh, and it is the Modern Spellcasters Tarot. And the reason I've chosen this one is that it's, um, it's, it's a, it's not just an entry level deck. It's not that it's all uh, easy imagery. You'll find there's some quite interesting, challenging imagery in here for uh, tarot uh, aficionados. But it is basically, broadly, a Rider Waite based deck and um, as such it's pretty easy to get into if you are at all familiar with that system, with the RWS system. Um, so what you get is you get this sturdy box which opens in this rather lovely way, and then a little pull thing which helps you pull out the guidebook, um, a fairly substantial guidebook, and then the cards, which we will come on to in a second. The deck is by Melanie Marquis, or Marquis, and illustrated by Scott Murphy, who I think is, um, if I'm remembering correctly, is uh, an illustrator of comic books, um, or has worked in comic books. So, um, I'll read you what it says on the back so that you get a sense of what the deck is purporting to be and to see if you uh, would agree that it's for the kind of thing that you might be interested in. And again, are these glasses squint? My glasses always seem to be squint, but maybe it's just the angle of the camera. Anyway, a modern approach to spell casting and paganism. With the Spellcaster's Handbook as your guide, that's this obviously, you'll combine traditional tarot symbolism with contemporary witchcraft for truly magical results. Discover how to use the tarot in your spell casting. Interpret each card's powerful symbols and enhance your divinatory skills with easy spread. So this deck can easily be used just as a divination tool. You don't need to use it for magic or you can of course use it for magic if you want. Featuring ancient pagan mythos, diverse ethnicities and practical spell work, Scott Murphy's gorgeous art depicts the familiar e elements of the Rider Waite, the Rider -Waite system in a fresh, unique style that's relevant to today's practitioner. Whether you're a beginning or experienced witch, this handbook offers a variety of ways to improve your craft and divination. Lovely glossy pages, full colour illustrations, so um, you know you know exactly what you're looking at. Um, and in terms of the contents, what you've got in here is um, Anatomy of a Tarot, so it tells you all about the structure of a tarot deck, uh, the basic structure and how correspondences work, and the correspondence, correspondences that have been chosen 
specifically for this deck. So there are some um, uh, particular correspondences that have been um, chosen. So for example, in this deck, Pentacles is Earth, as we would expect. Um, Wands is air and swords is fire, which of course isn't um, uh, what many of us are used to and isn't the association that goes with the, uh, the standard Rider Waite Smith system. Uh, cups are water, and then uh, she gives correspondences for each of those. Um, it is specifically a tarot built for magic, so she explains that the deck has been specifically designed for effectiveness both as a magical tool and an accurate system of divination. In each card you'll find animal totems and other magic symbols to help make your tarot spell casting more powerful and effective and to provide further clues into the tarot's divinatory meanings. Here are some of the symbols you will find in this deck. Yin and Yang, meaning duality, polarity and union, and the Triketra for manifestation magic, creative forces coming together, the square to, to represent structure, order, limits, restrictions, the eight-pointed star for balance and strength, the dog for loyalty, protection, help and comfort, the squirrel for resourcefulness, preparation, energy, prudence, the bird for movement, swiftness, clear vision, a higher perspective, the wolf for instinct, intelligence, fear and force, and the bull for stubbornness, strength, virility and willpower. Numerology in the tarot, she does give um, an indication that the, the numbers are important, which of course is music to my ears. If you are interested in numerology and tarot, um, then uh, you will enjoy this and you'll know that I am, uh, hence my series Tarot of the Nines, which is linked below. Um, she talks about num number one, representing unity, wholeness, beginnings, the pure or essential essence of the element represented, two meaning dualistic aspects, three engaging in activity suggested by the element, creation, expression, four putting into form, etc, etc, etc. So fairly standard numerological representations. Uh, there's a bit in here about tarot deck care and maintenance, um, how to read the cards, and then a whole section on using the tarot for magic, and then um, information about each of the different um, cards themselves and it ends with some tarot spreads uh, specifically for uh, your delectation. Just quickly looking at the section on how to use tarot for magic just so you get a sense of what's in here. Um, this is a, a kind of a treatise on how it all works, um, looking at how you can uh, make tarot talismans, how you can reverse a card to create um, a particular change, um, how you can use tarot for magical substitution, um, how you can place two cards face to face if you want to combine energies or bring something together, um, using multiple cards to show a step by step progression, um, moving cards away or towards each other is a way to manipulate your tarot cards for spell work, sliding the cards um, away or toward another card. Uh, this symbolizes the desire to attract or bring close whatever it is that's represented in the card, while moving a card further away symbolizes that you're diminishing, banishing, and generally getting rid of whatever it is that the card represents. And then there's a sample tarot spell for good luck and success, and one for protection, healing, and banishing negativity, and you also learn how to cast a circle with the tarot. So some very, very useful information in here. So let's have a quick look through the images on the card. And I've got some something in my mouth. That's better. Um, and what I'll do is, as usual, I'll just whiz through these, and if there's anything in particular that um, strikes me as being uh, of interest, I will stop and have a look in the book. Um, and uh, the first thing to say is here we have the fool, and I love that the fool is stepping out between the sun and the moon. Um, stepping into the world of duality is how I would see that. In fact, see, I can't help myself, I've started already. Let's see what it says about the fool. Um, I love the artwork in this deck. Uh, you'll see what I mean. Um, description. Encapsulating the idea of spirit unencumbered by self-awareness or the needs and demands of the flesh, the fool is truly the free spirit turned archetype. On a spiritual level, the fool may represent letting go of the ego, living for the moment, or a full immersion into a more spiritual, less materialistic lifestyle. Um, yeah, so it's fairly standard meanings of the fool. Um, magical uses, good for use in magic to move past worry or doubt to clear your head before or after rituals, to let go of attachments, to increase boldness or to bring cheer and lightheartedness. One thing to say about the guidebook that um, uh, is slightly disappointing 
is that it doesn't really give very much information about why particular choices were made by the artist in relation to the imagery. I would have liked to have seen more in the guidebook about, you know, why we've depicted the, the fool stepping out off the cliff, as you would expect in, in tarot, specifically between the sun and the moon. So, you know, so it doesn't mention that. Um, obviously, if you are into symbolism at all, you can figure it out, but it would be quite nice to have that kind of information. Here we have the magician. And here we have one of the, the cards in this deck that I know some people don't like. I love it, and it is the High Priestess. And the reason I love it is I just think it's such a powerful image. Um, I love the fact that the High Priestess is faceless, which I think um, conveys a great deal of the meaning of the card. Also, this reminds me of, um, there was, in the 70s, there was a television series in the UK called Armchair Thriller, and there was one that I saw as a kid. Uh, it was a, it was like a um, one of these series that, that had different stories uh, running across several episodes. And one of the stories was called Quiet as a Nun. And it involved this nun, this nun that had no face. And it scared the living out of me when I was a kid. And I loved it. I loved it. In fact, if I, if I can find a clip of that show, I will link it below so you can be scared too. But this card reminds me of the faceless nun. <gasps> and there we have a little baby in wrapped in... Well, it looks like it's wrapped in kind of leaves, either a green cloth or leaves. Again, I'm going to stop and just have a look. I don't think it tells you, though, what the meaning is of, of that. Um, High Priestess, da 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 da, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't say anything about why the High Priestess has got no face here, although you can figure that out, and nothing about the little baby. Um, what the little baby made me think of immediately is... Moses in the bulrushes in the biblical story and of course Moses um, and his brother Aaron if I'm remembering my bible correctly had um, uh, Aaron in particular I think was um, associated with magic in some way I might need to look that up and so might you that's your homework find out why the High Priestess card has got a baby that is reminding Brian of baby Moses and of what does that mean? The Empress. Again, I love that card, love the bull. Um, this kind of reminds me of um, the Green Lady in Star Trek. <laughs> the Emperor. Mm, Hierophant. Always a tricky card and there's something about that card that makes it look almost devilish if you look at the the people below. The lovers. Chariot. A lovely chariot card. The lotus flower. How beautiful. Strength. The Hermit. They're kind of photorealistic images, but not like photos. Um, but they're very, uh, very good, high quality art, I think. The Wheel of Fortune. I love that one. Justice. Wow, the Hangman. Now, the Hangman card here makes me think of, um, well, there's light and dark on either side of the tree. It makes me think of duality, perhaps something about being trapped in duality. And unusually for the Hanged Man, this individual is not being hung upside down, but they are being hung in some kind of confined cage, like a straitjacket and a coffin. Um, so there's something there about being trapped. Uh, but it also reminds me of escapism. So it makes me think of Harry Houdini. So I get the feeling that this hanged man is probably about to come out of there unexpectedly against all odds or may even have already come out of there and will suddenly pop up from behind the tree. And also the runes around the tree, of course, make me think of uh, Idrassil, the, uh, the tree that Odin was suspended from. 
um, until he figured out the secret of, of life, the universe and everything. And again, I'm going to stop just to see if it says anything about that. Um, hangman. Uh, Two primary themes, transcension and suspension. Although physically trapped and bound, the hanged man overcomes his circumstances to gain spiritual and mental freedom. The physical body and the physical world are but temporary vessels that can only partially contain the spirit, while the liberated soul treads freely and forever. Um, so that kind of is what it conveyed to me. But no particular explanation of why those images were chosen, which may be deliberate, of course. It may well be that the artist and the author wanted the images to speak for themselves, which I think is fair enough. Symbolism doesn't have to be explained always, although I'm always fascinated to know, by the way, that's death. I'm always fascinated to know why people choose the images they do. Temperance and Mercury. Oh boy. This is one of the more disturbing devil cards I have ever seen, so brace yourselves. Wow. That's... that's pretty weird. Which in some ways, of course, the devil should be. The tower. Star. I'm liking the multicultural references in this deck that are they feel very natural, they don't feel forced, they don't feel tokenistic, um, they feel real. And I love in this card that the distinction between the dog, the domesticated dog and the wolf howling at the moon, is very clear. In some cards, including the Rider Waite Smith deck, I think you have to kind of peer it a bit to figure out which is the dog, which is the wolf. It's pretty clear here. A little dashend, miniature dashend, lovely. There's his son. Judgment, very Wiccan looking image there with the cauldron and the, the moon and everything. Uh, idea of transfiguration and transformation perhaps, almost phoenix-like energy there. Burning up and then rising anew. That's what magic's about. And we have the world gorgeous. So those are the majors and whizzing onto the minors, ace of cups, two of cups. Nice to see two men in that card. Three of cups. Four. Five. It's nice that these cards are borderless. The images just really, really pop. Six, a lovely modern kind of slant to that image. Seven of Cups. I love that. What a great representation of planetary magic. Eight of Cups. Genie of the Nine of Cups and the Ten of Cups. And then interestingly, into the court cards, here's a page with three people in it. Unusual. <laughs> Knight of Cups. We normally have the um uh, in many decks, the page of cups, of course, with his cup and a little fish coming out. Here we have a big fish, and it's the knight that's riding this fish with his cup. The queen of cups. And the king of cups. So, um, now we have the pentacles. Ace. We're still in the standard, you know... Pentacles are Earth, very plainly, although we've got some sea imagery there as we do normally in the Two of Pentacles with the boats. Um, so Pentacles are Earth and Cups are Water and that's coming across pretty clearly. When we move on... Interesting, a kind of hobbit hole for the Five of Pentacles. 
You're too big to come into the Hobbit Hole. That's what the dog seems to be saying. When we move on to the uh, swords and wands, we'll see the contrast uh, where um, what we might be used to in terms of elemental attributions are reversed. Oh, a lovely card. Eight of Pentacles, building a nice stone hut for the dog and the squirrel. Nine of Pentacles. More squirrels. And the ten. Page. Squirrels are a theme in the Pentacles, including giant squirrels. And then the Queen. And the King. So now we're into the Wands, where air is the representing factor. And I think that's made pretty clear. Oops. There's the Triketra that I mentioned earlier, earlier on the tunic. Three, oh, that's lovely. Four, like a kind of hand fasting. Five of Wands. And here's a rather nice one. So, first of all, the Five of Wands usually means motion and conflict, but um, this looks almost like a game of some sort, although it seems to be. They seem to be whacking the hornet's nest, or the wasp's nest, which probably isn't very fair on the poor little creatures. And then the Six of Wands normally is about domination and conflict, but it looks as though this is a leadership person that others are perhaps respecting rather than rebelling against. Seven of Wands. Eight of Wands, again with that great motion of flying skywards, which is um, appropriate for the elemental attribution in this deck. Nine, ten, page. I think this is a gorgeous deck. Really, really powerful warming imagery. Lovely autumnal feelings in the court cards of the wands. And then onto the swords where Guess what? It's fire. Only two of the swords does not look very fiery. Three of swords instead of the usual stylized heart with the three swords through it, we have a real heart. Well, illustration of the real real heart. Four of swords. Interesting that there's so much cold imagery so far in the swords. Um, given that it's fire, but then fire is about coping with the cold, I suppose. Six of Swords. Seven. Eight. Nine. Idea of Thoughts are pressing us while sunshine is all around. Ten. Page with a hugely oversized sword. Let's just see what it says about one of the core cards. We'll pick the page just out of interest. Courage and bravery despite inexperience. Eagerness to prove oneself. A young person has the willingness to conquer obstacles, an individual who is self-assured, daring, and perhaps a bit brazen in their action. Use and the magical use is useful in spells and charms intended to encourage greater spontaneity and increase confidence, courage, and boldness. So, you'll be bold enough to pick up a sword that size. And finally, the Knight of Swords. Queen of Swords. of sorts. That was the Magical Spellcaster's Tarot. I think a very accessible, beautiful, but nonetheless intriguingly magical deck. So that's it for me from now and uh, I hope you, uh, you enjoyed that walkthrough. I'll see you all again very soon.